That's a hard follow, I tell you what. <laughs> um, encouraging, encouraging stuff. Thanks, Isaiah, man. That was, I'm pumped. You pumped? I'm pumped. All right. Um, I wanted to share with you um, some, uh, 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 all right, one silly thing from your pastor. Uh, I, I had two weeks in a row that bombed on jokes, so I'm kind of trying to get in a different direction. So anyways, um, uh, one, one thing from uh, worship, um, shoot, what was, the, what was the third song we sang? Come, came to my rescue, that was it. If you've ever, uh, this happens to me quite often during worship, I'm like, man, you know what would, what would do this song a lot of good? Uh, a big drum kit and uh, distorted guitars and um, some head banging and long hair. And if you've ever thought to yourself, man, came to my rescue would sound good, just like I described, there is a song out there. There's a band called The Great Commission who did a rendition of Came to My Rescue that is, uh, we'll, we'll just call it the, the rock and roll version. And uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing like I am, Look them up. The Great Commission came to my rescue. You won't be disappointed. I also, so, two things uh, to uh, give you note of this week. Um, some good news on the radar that you probably didn't hear about. Um, our president, President Trump, uh, signed a, a Born Alive executive order um, pr protecting um, uh, children who are born alive due to like a, a botched abortion. And so the Born Alive executive order basically says that they're um, guaranteed to then be granted medical care at that point in their life. So so some good news, some exciting things you, you probably didn't hear about. Also, on a more local note, if you are interested at all in getting involved, I know that our church feed has been blowing up with just our ranching community and everyone just, just looking help and helping each other out and like um, doing a lot of stuff to, to get animals out and evacuate families and all of that. If you're interested at all in donating to the uh, Mullen Fire, just firefighters and, and things, uh, j just, to, just to support. If you're like, man, I don't have time, but I, but, but I have some, some spare money, I could, I could dump some supplies off. Um, this information here, if you like Google or search Mullen Fire, there, there's a group that, that is just putting information on how to help and what they need and whatever. But, but this was kind of like the tangible thing that I found. And um, you can drop off stuff uh, uh, through Saturday, October 3rd. And then there's four um, locations there at the bottom of the page. And then definitely um, be praying for the firefighters that are there. Be praying for the communities, uh, specifically Albany and um, Centennial, that are like uh, on evacuation notice or evacuated uh, currently. So just pray for that. Keep them in your prayers. Pray for rain. Um, pray for endurance for the firefighters. That's kind of the the only things I have for you to, yeah, helpful, helpful hints, helpful things going on. Um, good news. Anyways, we are going to be resuming our study in Mark chapter 12. Um, Looking at, we're going to be, be looking at verses 18 through 27 today, and I'm going to pray for us, and we will um, jump in at that point. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for uh, just the, the gift of worship, being able to be in your presence this morning. I also thank you for um, Isaiah and his exposition of the word that has already taken place this morning. That was just super encouraging and um, very uh I don't want to say inspiring. That makes it sound like like uh, touchy feely, nice warm feelings inside. But it's more. But it is inspiring in the fact that he's he uh, urged us on with with the message to 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 live out our our lives in a Christ like way to 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 be. Be the church, be your hands and feet, be your example of love to the world. That's what you've called us to be, your ambassadors. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would give us the confidence to do that, that you would make us all the more aware of the great work that you've done on our behalf, and that that would, um, yeah, just just fill us to the brim with um, excitement, with gratitude, that we would then be willing to uh, share that 
with, with the world around us. Lord, I also want to lift up our ranching uh, communities and, and families that I know who have been evacuated. Lord, I thank you so much for um, just everyone, just just over our Facebook page and, and messenger, just everyone that is willing to, to, that has been willing to help out and assist in moving animals and moving things and moving people. And just pray, Lord, that you would um, give each one, each family, just endurance for um, this this time that they're that they that we're, that they're in that they're facing with just the the dangers of the fire and and I just pray, Lord, that you would um, pr- protect them and, and and grant them peace and and just just light the way, uh, whatever they need, Lord, wherever they need to go. Um, wh- wherever they need to get things, just that you would open doors and, and supply um, their needs. And Lord, I also want to lift up the firefighters who are bravely just, it, it, it seems like a almost insurmountable task to um, fight the forces of nature with, with this fire. And yet you've called these, these brave men and women to do just that. And I just pray for their endurance, for their protection, that you could encourage and uplift them and just give them some progress that would, that would um, spur them on. And I uh, thank you for their efforts. And um, yeah, Lord, I also thank you for this time that we can gather as a body and encourage one another in the fellowship and also be encouraged by the proclamation, the hearing of your word. May it uh, go deep into our hearts, teach us, change us, mold us more and more into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, we have been continuing our study in the book of Mark. We continue our study in Mark chapter 12, examining yet another interaction that is recorded for us here between Jesus and the religious leaders. Um, this, this crew we see in confrontation with Jesus last week, they're an unlikely team when we considered their backgrounds, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians, one being motivated by their hardcore religious background and the other being uh, politically motivated. And yet we see both of these groups come in partnership against a common enemy, which was Jesus. And they are willing to apply that old adage adage that the enemy of my enemy is my friend and join forces against their common enemy, like I said, who was Jesus, who was making moves and making waves in the community. He was stealing their thunder, as it were, and gaining popularity among the people. So they weren't happy about it. They're driven by jealousy. And so they confront Jesus. And that's what we see in this whole section from where we picked up at the end of Mark 11 and verse 27 and on through now um, chapter 12. A lot of time is given to these interactions between Jesus and the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And Jesus, we see last week, he, he skillfully and tactfully navigates their inquiry as kind of their goal is to catch Jesus in his words. We see in verse 13 by asking him a question regarding taxes. And Jesus tactfully answers their inquiry by putting the issues in their proper place. The kingdom of God as primary with the realm of politics and the way of the world falling below that. Alistair Begg observes, if you like, we might say that Jesus is here putting politics in its place, putting an understanding of one's responsibility to the state within the ultimate understanding of one's responsibility to God. And I wanted to just spend a quick minute here to encourage you that as a Christian, you are not called to abdicate your duty of citizenship. You're not called to abdicate your duty of, of voting. You are called to run your decisions in politics through the filter of God's word and your identity in Christ. And so when you do that, you, you don't let like your Christian faith give you like an out in politics. Like, oh, God's got it. I don't need to be involved at all. Um, you know. That I, I, I believe that that's the wrong type of mindset to, to take when in, in the realm of politics as a Christian. I believe that you are called to, like I said, let your Christian faith define your decisions and define how, 
how you vote, how you make those decisions, the, 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 the things you decide to support, the people you decide to support, and vote in that manner. And I would say anything you decide to support, any person you decide to support, line them up with what you know of God's word and vote in that manner. Let your Christian faith define your vote. And that may be like, oh man, he's talking about politics and church. You know, that's okay. That's okay. We can do that here. And if you would like to talk deeper, like specifics on who to vote for and what that, like I can talk to you outside of church about that. But here, I'm just going to tell you, let faith define your voting. Okay? And as a, and because, because right now, a lot of people are mad in government about people, specifically the, the recent a Supreme Court justice who's been nominated, uh, they're angry that she would allow her faith to define her decisions. And I would argue that anyone in the realm of, of anything, you, you, you are going to, your worldview is going to define your decisions. And so you either have a Christian worldview or you have a humanist or a agnostic or atheistic worldview. And they're, in my opinion, those are the only two options. And so what they're advocating, they're saying is like, well, we don't like it when Christians let their worldview define their decisions, but they're going to force the decision of humanism like saying that that's okay. So I would say pray for your leadership, that they would allow their Christian faith to, to make their decisions in, in legislation and in government, and, and definitely apply that same standard to yourself. Um, those are my thoughts on, on politics. Like I said, we can get deeper into it if you would like. I, would, I love talking politics. So, so if you, if you want to talk politics, that, that's great. Um, and I would love to do that. Preferably, like, over lunch, over coffee, something like, 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 as long as there's food or, or something involved that makes it a little bit more comfortable, right? Anyway, so detour finished, back on the main track. John or Mark, yeah, don't even know where I am. Uh, <clears throat> Mark, uh, verse uh, chapter twelve, verses eighteen through twenty-seven. Um, we see here Jesus faces yet again another test from the religious leadership, this time coming from a group known as the Sadducees. And this is a thought-provoking observation from Gino Geraci. He says, During the Passover, the religious leaders would examine the lamb to determine whether or not it constituted a suitable sacrifice. The lamb must be perfect. We read in 1 Peter 1, 18-19. And the religious leaders continue their examination of Jesus. Which if you just give your, give your mind a moment to just kind of like dwell on that thought, it's, it's such an amazing thought that Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who is going to be the Passover Lamb, the one who is sacrificed on behalf of the sins of the world, is facing scrutiny and examination here from the religious leaders. They don't even know what they're doing, but they're like fulfilling the purpose of God and the sacrifice of God. It's just so amazing that God's up here <laughs> just orchestrating everything, and like they're down here, just unwittingly following in this plan and purpose of God. And I'm sure, like, if if they would have been given like like a, a an outsider's perspective, like given this this point of view that's like, hey, this is actually what you're doing, they would have been dumbfounded, right? Like, man, we don't we don't want any part of this, but. Here they are. And uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, that verse that Gino references, it says, Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we see here the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians have all carried out their um, inspections and fielded their questions to the Lamb of God. Now the Sadducees are next in line. And we see in verse 18 it says, Then some Sadducees who came, then some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and they asked him, Isn't that an interesting way to be defined? I, you, you should always consider, like, like, what actions, am, and this 
plays right into what Isaiah was talking about. What actions am I taking today, tomorrow, next hour, next few minutes? What actions am I taking that is going to be defining me, my title? The Sadducees are defined as people who believe that there is no resurrection. That's that's who Mark. That's how Mark describes them. That's how they're presented to us. You want to know something about the Sadducees? Well, these guys believe that there's no resurrection. This life, that's all there is. Very interesting. So your choices, the decisions you make, just like Isaiah said, will define you. So how is that? Take inventory. How is that going to be? If Mark's writing in his gospel about you, what's it going to say? For the Sadducees, they're defined by their belief that there is no resurrection. And they came to him and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died, nor did he leave any offspring, and the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. (laughs) No kidding. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as a wife. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore mistaken. Mistaken. This is the, as we read this passage, and we see these Sadducees come like a blip on the radar screen, because this is the first and last time that the Sadducees are mentioned in Mark's gospel. Well, who are they? Well, first off, the Sadducees were descendants of a ruling class of priests from the time of the Maccabean Revolt a few generations earlier. They were the aristocratic party, or the high society types of the day, if you will. They were made up of the high priestly class and also of lay family members of the leading individuals of Jerusalem. They were socially influential on account of their wealth and their status. They apparently were notoriously arrogant and harsh in their execution and administration of justice. And they were at the same time on the theologically conservative end of the spectrum of Judaism and of their doctrines. They are so conservative, in fact, that they only deal with the section of the Law of Moses known as the Pentateuch. That is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Anything outside of that portion of Scripture, the Sadducees, didn't deal with it. They didn't think it held any weight. If it wasn't in those five books, it it didn't matter to them. Yet, with all this being said, (laughs) their main defining characteristic is their beliefs on the subject of resurrection. Namely, there isn't one. And Mark mentions this, like I said, to describe them. And so we just, I just find it so interesting, this group of men, of all the things that they could have accomplished, of all of their ideas, of all of the things that can define someone, this was the thing. Oh, there goes those Sadducees guys, right? You see them walking down the street. Can you believe they don't even believe in the resurrection? Can you believe it? And so... This gives you kind of a picture of who the Sadducees were. And so they come to Jesus with this subject in mind, this resurrection, which is so interesting because they didn't believe in it, yet obviously they, they, they gave a lot of time to it. It's, uh, it's probably something like it was constantly in the back of their mind, like giving them a hard time, you know, like like like, it, like it's a thing you, you can't escape. If you're told to like... Don't think about white elephants. Well, what are you thinking about? (laughs) 
white elephants, right? It's like they were, they were, it was like that with, with the Sadducees. Hey, we don't believe in the resurrection. We don't, we don't think about the resurrection. Well, come to find out, it, was, it took up a lot of their time and, and, and thought process, right? And so they come with this subject in mind, again with the intention of either disproving Jesus' t- teaching or catching him in his words, or maybe it was an a, a attempt to uh, elevate their own stock with the people. Whatever it was, they come to Jesus. Maybe they're in this group. They've seen the other groups of religious leaders try their hands at dialogue with Jesus, and now maybe they can find success where their colleagues could not. Maybe this is their mindset. Hey, everyone's tried and failed so far. We've got the thing that we think can knock Jesus off course. And in order to do this, they put together this insane hypothetical story based off of a passage from the book of Deuteronomy. Now, before we delve into their story, I think that it's important we should first look uh, in interest of context and knowing kind of what they're talking about, what we're talking about and looking at. Um, I think it's important we'll turn to Deuteronomy 25, where they actually uh, pick up this, this doctrine. Uh, Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, tells us, If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go in to her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which he bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, and his name may not be that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel. It's a very unique name. uh, The house of him who had his sandal removed. (sighs) Interesting, right? Right? Am I right? You cannot you cannot read that and come away with like, oh yeah, that seems perfectly normal to me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens every day, you know, in Laramie, Wyoming. You see people at the front of the courthouse taking their shoes off and spitting in their face, right? <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. And so, so what we see, like, you're reading that, it's like, all right, Lord, what the heck? Like, like what does this have to do with anything? And, and I think that it points to two things, or actually, wait. Yeah, two things. It points to the importance of lineage and genealogy in Jewish culture. God, from the beginning, when he, when he called Abraham to himself and he said, Hey, I'm going to make create from you a great nation. What we see, well, from the beginning of the Bible, but what we see specifically from Abraham is this lineage that's set up, this genealogy. And God has done this. I mean, for multiple reasons, but I think the main reason is that you can trace back through history the line from Abraham all the way to Jesus through the Old Testament. If you pay attention to the genealogies, if you read um, the genealogies of Jesus in Matthew or in Luke, both of those places, you, you see it traced back. And, and it's a way that God could prove the line of the Messiah that he could prove the consistency of his word, the consistency of his promise. And so God used this idea, this Jewish culture of placing such an importance on genealogy in a way to just accomplish his work, that he's going to call the Messiah out of this strict genealogical society, that they pay attention to it, they track it, and the Messiah would come out of it. It was almost a foolproof way. That God could trace, like, on down through the generations, um, the, the proof of his promise, the proof of his word. So it was very important. Um, 
I, an important ordinance that God didn't want there to be a line that ever just abruptly ended, had this dead end, but was actually carried on. And so Jewish people put an importance on it in that way, and then it was a part of their God-ordained construction. It was just how the Jewish culture worked. You paid attention to your genealogy. You knew who your, your, your parents were, your, great, your, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and probably on down through the generations, probably all the way back to Abraham, a person could recite their genealogy. And we see this, this is referred to, this, this passage in Deuteronomy 25 as the Leverate, Leverate Law. When a husband died without a son, the Leverate Law said that his brother was to marry his wife and bear a son. This law considered the son to be the firstborn of the son of the deceased brother. And this assured two things, that the family name continued and that the property could be kept in the family. The law was given in part to help preserve and enlarge the nation of Israel. And if you want to see an example where it's actually played out in Scripture, the book of Ruth, Ruth and Boaz, and carrying on the lineage of Ruth and, and the lineage of Naomi and her, and her family. So if you want to read about it, Ruth is a short book. I would encourage you. It's an encouraging book. It's a love story. It also has some strange things that happen in it, but it but it's a great book. And if you want to know, like, man, what's this leave right thing all about? There's actually an instance where Boaz goes, takes the sandal off of his foot, and like that whole that whole situation plays out in the book of Ruth. Don't believe me? Read it. So the Sadducees are now using this passage as their base for the hypothetical situation that they put together. And present to Jesus. Then some Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to him. They asked him saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her and he died, nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as a wife. <sighs> Hydrate or die. All right. Um, so, just a couple, a couple things I want to throw out there are at you. Um, number one. Are you thankful that you are not in my shoes this morning, <laughs> teaching on this passage? Um, what do you What do you do with it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, in all honesty, like this is if, if you want to talk about hard sayings of Jesus, is stuff that is like, how do I, what? Like I said, what What do I do with it? What do we What do we do with it? Um, this definitely has to fall in that category. Right, and um, second, as you read through this, I don't know about you, but uh, Lemony Snicket's "A Series of Unfortunate Events" came to mind. It's like, like this family, like there's one thing after another. I mean, we we're, like the Sadducees didn't go into great detail about how everybody died, but I'm sure it was like, I mean, it's tragic, right? And th so we we see the Sadducees piece together one of the most unlikely preposterous, and inconceivable illustrations of all time in order to attempt, in order to like put together an attempt at uh, disproving or proving their beliefs in regards to the afterlife or eternity. Basically, like, there isn't one. And because, as I've mentioned earlier, and as Mark is quick to point out, as helpful commentary, the Sadducees did not believe in the realm or the reality of eternity or an eternal spiritual existence after death. Their belief lay solely in the physical here and now, with nothing lying beyond this life. And so we're now faced with the daunting task of trying to make some sort of sense out of this inconceivable hypothetical story that Jesus is presented with by the Sadducees. And in order to do this, I think it will be helpful to just point out three things to notice, and we'll focus on these three things. Number one, the spirit of the question. 
which it, it takes a little bit of like imagination, but I don't think it's like out there crazy imagination. It's not unfounded. So the spirit of the question, and I think the spirit of the question is with a mocking or sarcastic, sarcastic attitude. Number two, the predetermined position of the Sadducees. We already know about them. It's, the, it's how they're defined. They don't believe in the resurrection. And then number three, the misunderstanding of heaven. Trying to put an earthly, an earthly titles, earthly definitions, an earthly way of life on things of heaven, which I think is a misunderstanding of heaven, and Jesus is going to break that down for us. So number one, the spirit of the question. Once again, we run into the issue of fully understanding this conversation uh, and, and lacking that full understanding because there is a lack of body language or being able to see the Sadducees' actions as they are putting this story together. We don't know that. We only have it in text form. But as we read it, we can almost pick up a tinge of sarcasm paired with an eye roll or two as well. If you picture it in this way, the Sadducees come up to Jesus and they ask him, so, so Jesus in the resurrection, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like that's a real thing. And uh, so in the resurrection, we uh, have the story for you, right? So there's a little bit of sarcasm there. There's no sincerity behind their words. They aren't interested in what Jesus actually believes or what he has, in fact, come to declare. They only find any belief of the afterlife inconceivable. Like Princess Bride? It's inconceivable. And anyone who could believe in such a thing is silly, right? And I, this, this comes from... from our, our status as human beings in this realm of flesh, in this finite reality, that Batman begins, he's down towards the beginning, he's down there talking to Carmine Falcone, the, the mob boss, right? And Carmine Falcone, one of the best lines in the whole movie, tells him, you know, you always fear what you don't understand. You always fear what you don't understand. And I think that the Sadducees are coming from this place of fear not understanding what the resurrection, what eternity actually looks like. They don't understand it. They, they don't really want to understand it. And so they're afraid of it. And so instead of actually like harnessing that fear, <laughs> just had uh, Denzel Washington from, from Remember the Titans come in to, we, we harness that fear, harness that aggression into a team effort. Anyways, um, so, so they're afraid of, of the resurrection. And so instead of like delving into that fear and facing it head on, they just avoid it. Like, ah, there's no such thing. Like, like you can drive around in fear that a police officer is going to pull you over for speeding all day long. And you can just choose like, eh, I don't believe in that, <laughs> right? I'm afraid of it, so I'm just going to not believe in it. And uh, come to find out, if you roll 50 down grand, you're going to get pulled over. <laughs> and so reality is going to hit you. So, so if, you, if you're afraid of something, don't, don't avoid it. Face it. And then in their feeble attempt to avoid and suppress the subject of eternity, we, we know from Ecclesiastes 3 that their efforts are in vain because Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us that God has put eternity in their hearts. Any human being, if you're willing to be honest with yourself and, and look inside and, and think about your existence, if you're willing to be honest, there's, there's got to be something more to this. It can't just be this, Right? If this is all there is, then that, um, that's a bummer, <laughs> to put it bluntly. That's a bummer, okay? So he has put eternity in their hearts, and so in order to suppress that feeling, they just decide they're going to reject it, reject the reality. However, we are told that the Sadducees' predetermined position on the matter is to deny the existence of the eternal. So it's been revealed to them, but they deny it. And we find that this position is rooted in their misunderstanding of heaven, what it will be like, and they place earthly expectations and worldly understanding on the realm of heaven and its functions. Now, in order to break down their misunderstanding, 
we're going to transition into the tactful answer of Jesus and his, understa- and his understanding of heaven and the things to come. So Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken, because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. They don't become angels in heaven. We'll talk about it anyways. But concerning the dead, they rise... Have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Excuse me. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Why is it difficult for the human mind to comprehend the things of heaven? Number one, because we're fallen. Number two, because we're flesh. Number three, because we're finite. Fallen, flesh, finite. Those things really do a number on hindering any understanding of eternal things or things of heaven. We're fallen, we're fleshly, we're finite. But we've given, we've been given ample detail and information regarding the subject of our eternal home. I just want to share Three quick passages with you on the subject of heaven. 1 Corinthians 2, 9-10, through 10, Paul writes, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. 2 Peter 3.13 tells us, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I am pumped on that verse because there is a lot of unrighteousness and injustice happening in the world and i am stoked to live in the land of promise that place of the heavenly shores where righteousness dwells where that's like the defining factor of heaven that god is there jesus is there judging rightly and righteously i am pumped on that because our world is unrighteous and unjust and just unbearable at the moment. And to be where righteousness dwells, that's going to be exciting. Anyways, and then 1 Corinthians, coming back to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15.50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. And I think this is where the Sadducees were getting tripped up because they were trying to put flesh and blood into a realm of spirit and truth. And you, it, it doesn't go there. It requires a, a, new, a new body to, to live in this new heaven and new earth. So just from these verses, we can deduce that the human mind and heart require some assistance in gaining any sort of comprehension or understanding on the subjects of heaven and eternity. It's through the Holy Spirit that God gives us uh, any information, any knowledge into heavenly or eternal things. And it just can't be the case that in our humanity, in our flesh, that we can comprehend what what heaven is going to be like or what lays whole, lay, lays ahead for us there. It takes information sourced from God's word, aided by revelation from the Holy Spirit, to gain any sort of bearing on the things unseen and immortal. Because our human mortality and fallen nature cripples us when it comes to the realm of eternity. So, getting to the root of the question. Jesus does this. He gets to the root of the question, letting the Sadducees know that, hey, I don't know where you got your information from, but in fact, you are mistaken and you lack understanding. The root of the question, although the Sadducees frame it in a way you would think it is marriage and eternity, the root of the question, rather, is a lack of understanding of Scripture and a lack of understanding of the power of God. Alistair Beggs uh, observes, Jesus says, you know what your problem probably is? You don't know the Bible. You don't know the scriptures. And you don't know the power of God. If you knew the scriptures, you would know not to ask this question. If you knew the power of God, you would realize that in the purposes of God, there are dimensions that we have not yet seen, but into which we will inevitably enter. 
So Jesus breaks down their inquiry, in, breaks down their inquiry, piece by piece. First, marriage. Jesus tells us they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And this may be a hard word to receive. Marriage is a joy here on earth. And especially as a man, I love being married to my wife. I love marriage as the institution. All of it. I love it. All of it. How God set it up, the blessing he, he gives us in, in wives and husbands, it's amazing. But marriage, I, I define marriage in this way. Marriage is a heavenly institution with an earthly ordinance. A heavenly institution with an earthly ordinance. Because in Genesis, when God sets it up, the earthly ordinance, he tells uh, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, in Genesis 1.28. And then he reiterates this command to Noah in Genesis 9.1, telling him, hey, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. There's an earthly ordinance from God in regards to marriage. And if we examine marriage in this way, there will be no need for marriage in the heavenly kingdom because there will be no procreation there, no need to raise up the next generation. Yes, yes, we're getting there as well. Uh, there will be a new marriage relationship established between the bridegroom, Jesus, and the church, his bride. So that relationship will take precedence over any earthly relationships that we have here. So that's kind of the, the realm of marriage, how it's, how it's, we have the earthly ordinance, and then we also have the heavenly reality that Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is his bride, and that relationship is going to be established at the great supper of the Lamb. And then second, angels. An added dig by Jesus, I think, that because if the Sadducees didn't believe in the existence of, of the resurrection, they obviously didn't believe in the existence of supernatural beings either. So Jesus is like, oh, by the way, angels, uh, we'll talk about them too. And I wanted to note, we won't become angels, but we will be like angels. And I think this guy, Ivor Powell, short sentence that gives us insight into what this means. He says, the redeemed will be as angels, seeing and serving and praising God. We won't be angels, but we will be like angels in that we practice these things. We, we get to witness God in his, in his glory. We get to serve him and praise him in eternity. And Jesus lets the Sadducees know that, that the dead do in fact rise, that the resurrection life is different from what we know here on earth, and that our existence and relationships will be different as well. Our bodies will be better, and our relationships richer, unhindered, and unencumbered by sin. Gino Dracy lists the benefits and differences, saying, What does this text and others in the Bible allow us to think about the eternal state? Our future life and relationships will not be less, but more. Future life and eternal life will be like, like that which is experienced by the angels. Heavenly life and relationships in that life will be perfect. Our relationships in this life will not cease, but they will be changed, perfected, untainted by selfishness and sin, bitter and resentment, foolishness and prejudice and pride. Our love will be perfected, and therefore we will treat each other in the perfection of Christ's love. A wife will not be loved imperfectly. A son or daughter will not be loved imperfectly. God will change all relations into perfection, even as the relationship between God and His holy angels are absolutely perfect. Heavenly life and relationships will be pure, perfect, and eternal. So now that Jesus has cleared up the, the clutter and misunderstanding of heaven and eternity, he now moves to cement his argument on the basis of God's word, inciting a passage from the Sadducees' own respected scriptures, no less. And this passage is God introducing himself to Moses through the burning bush. In Exodus 3, 6, it says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of of Jacob. Jesus here takes a stand on the authority of Scripture, standing for the truth, and not allowing the Sadducees the luxury of tolerance. Rather, he lets them know, hey, you are mistaken. In their, you are mistaken in your thinking. And then he uses Scripture to point them to the truth. And 
to break it down, I thought David Guzik's observation was simple and concise, and it really shed some light on how this applies. He, he observes, if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not continue to live, God would not say that he is their God, speaking in the present tense. He would have said that he was their God. Therefore, the scriptures proved there is a resurrection of the dead. And I would encourage you. So this week I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, some Mormon friends, um, Mormon elders, we'll call them, because that's what they refer to themselves as. I wouldn't say that they're friends. I only know them by their last names. Um, but anyways, um, sat down with them, and, and any strategy you have, of, of witnessing to someone, of talking to someone about the things of Jesus, talking to them about the gospel, you have to come back to the authority of God's word. If you're going to come up with your own idea, like, like man is fallible, All, our ideas are fallible, but the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts to the, the division of the joints and marrow. It, it's, it's eternal. It's God's word. It's con been consistent from beginning to end. It's unchanging, just as God is unchanging. And so if you're going to proclaim the gospel, if you're going to take a stand on authority, you have to take a stand on the authority of God's word. It has to be your foundation, your firm foundation. That parable where Jesus talks about the man who builds his house on the rock versus the man who builds his house on the sand, the rock of your foundation of your faith is God's word. If you're building your foundation on any other, any other source, any other foundation, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So, build your foundation on the word of God. This is your authority. And speak from that authority. Use it. Wield it. It's a sword. Use it. Use it. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, Paul writes to Timothy, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, what the man of God, that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The authority of God's word, the authority of scripture is what Jesus goes back to. Jesus could have spoke on the authority of himself. He's the word. He is the word. And he could have been like, I say this. I declare it. But he goes back to the scripture, goes back to their scripture, no less, and uses that as his authority to refute their claims. To close, I want to talk about two things. The importance of scripture and the importance of, of the resurrection. And this is going to go quick. The importance of scripture, I would say, is having a right or correct understanding. The Sadducees knew Scripture, and they were willing to, well, they didn't know Scripture. The Sadducees were willing to handpick only the Scriptures they liked or were comfortable with. Any others, they discarded. And this left them with not only an incomplete Scripture, but also an incomplete understanding of Scripture. A.W. Tozer observes, it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. If you want to pick and choose your way through Scripture, you're going to have an incomplete faith. You're going to have an incomplete walk. You're going to be an incomplete Christian. It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And it's essential that we discuss even the difficult parts and the parts that we're uncomfortable with. That's why we're going through this passage that you're like, what does this even do for me? What are they even talking about? It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. There are two errors the Christian should avoid at all costs when studying the Bible. Selective study, sticking to what you know, or what's nice, or what's comfortable. Don't do that. And number two, rejective study. Rejecting the things that are uncomfortable or we disagree with. Like, oh, God says that marriage is, is only between a man and a woman, but I'm uncomfortable with that because culture is adamantly against that. Like, make your stand on God's word. Let it define your terms. Let it define your morality. And let the rest of the world go where it may. The world is going to shift and change. The word of God is not. Stick to it. Stick to it. Don't be selective. Don't be rejective in your study of the word. If we fall into this trap, we find ourselves in the position of sharing company with the Sadducees when we're unable, and then we find ourselves in a place where we're unable to experience the power of God in our lives, and we will find both our understanding of God and our relationship with Him incomplete and lacking. 
Matthew Henry observes, Note, a right knowledge of the Scripture as the fountain whence all revealed religion now flows. Revealed religion now flows. And the foundation on which it is built is the best preservative against error. Keep the truth, the Scripture truth, and it shall keep thee. Keep the truth, the Scripture truth, and it shall keep thee. So that covers the importance of rightly understanding Scripture in the life of the believer. And to add to that, the importance of the resurrection. Matthew Henry writes, again, upon the whole matter, he concludes, Ye therefore do greatly err. Those that deny the resurrection greatly err and ought to be told so. Paul writes in regard to this matter in 1 Corinthians 15. I would encourage you for homework for this week to read the whole of 1 Corinthians 15. If you're curious about the resurrection, if you're curious about heaven, what it'll be like, it's a great summary chapter to get more information on what it will be like and what the resurrection means for the Christian. Starting in verse 12, Paul says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, and this feels like a uh, Dr. Seuss poem, right? Um, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. If you are still, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in, asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. The certainty of our faith hinges on the reality of Christ's resurrection. <laughs> and Paul goes through, and this is why I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 15, he goes through a bunch of eyewitness accounts, talks about his own eyewitness account of Jesus' resurrection, and his seeing him in his resurrected body. And so we, you can be encouraged by that record of the eyewitness accounts. The certainty of our faith hinges on the reality of Christ's resurrection as declared in the scripture. Without it, what is life worth? Paul says, nothing. Nothing. What's it for? What are we doing here? It's all meaningless. It's all worthless. To close, I borrowed a few more insights from David Guzik regarding the subject of the resurrection and its simple central importance in the life of the Christian and wanted to close with his findings. He observes, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. We can follow Paul's logic point by point. If there is no principle of resurrection, then Jesus did not rise from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then death has power over him and defeated him. If death has power over Jesus, he is not God. If Jesus is not God, he cannot offer a complete sacrifice for sins. If Jesus cannot offer a complete sacrifice for sins, our sins are not completely paid for before God. If my sins are not completely, completely paid for before God, then I am still in my sins. Therefore, if Jesus is not risen, he is unable to save. When you know, he continues, when you know what rests on the resurrection, you know why, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. First, the divinity of Jesus rests on the resurrection of Jesus, Romans 1, 4. The sovereignty of Jesus rests on the resurrection of Jesus, Romans 14, 9. Our justification rests on the resurrection of Jesus, Romans 4, 25. Our regeneration rests on the resurrection of Jesus, 1 Peter 1, 3. And our ultimate resurrection rests on the resurrection of Jesus. Do not fall into the mindset of the Pharisees that 
You only have hope in this life only. You don't know anything about the resurrection because it's foreign. It is not foreign. God has given us ample information on the reality of, of the resurrection, the reality of eternity, the reality of heaven and our heavenly home. You can study the rest of your life, if you wanted to, about its reality, what it means for you as a Christian. It's, it's a promise that God has made, and he, God keeps his word. If you, if you study scripture, that's the consistent theme of it. God keeps his word every single time. If God said it, it will come to pass. Eternity is waiting. Don't worry about it. Because Jesus has got it. He is the resurrection and the life. In him, we can, we can taste and see what, what our eternal home will be. So, Jesus, thank you for that reality. Thank you for your work on our behalf, that you were willing to um, do away with your... Not to do away, to, to put aside your heavenly existence your exalted nature, and taking the form of a man, you, the word, it tells us in, in John 1, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and it declared, it has declared the, the, the Father to us. You have declared the Father to us. We know God because of you. You took God as as an idea. God is spirit and became flesh and you made it tangible for us. So I thank you for that. And Lord, I thank you for your willingness to engage on hard topics. And I pray, Lord, that as your people following in your example, we would not shrink away from hard topics and hard discussions, but that we could uh, take confidence in your word as our authority and speak from that authority in regards to, to the hot topics of the, of the day or the, the hard discussions of the day. And Lord, there would be a lot less tumultuous happenings in the world if your church would just stand up and declare the truth of your word. That all men are created in, in the image of God. Therefore, racism is silly. I feel like that's the hot topic of the day. And, and, and all, all, all of humanity bears the image of God. And so they're worth something. And that, that refutes the, the idea of abortion. And, and we could go on and on, but I pray, Lord, that it would be on the authority of your word, not on our own ideas or our own findings, that we would engage in culture and proclaim your gospel. The good news of your coming. Thank you for redeeming us for saving us, for being the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and for giving us the, the promise of a relationship with you and the hope of a future resurrection. Let us live each and every day with that lens of eternity in mind so that we could honor and bless your name, be your ambassadors on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand?